Well, hey all, and welcome back. Last week, we looked at preparing our hearts to study the Bible and talked about different translations, the various methods we can use to study the Bible, and we explored how our mindset and prayer are an essential part of our study process. This week, we're gonna start by applying what we learned with a technique called verse mapping. Now, verse mapping is a method of study using a diagram or charts to study a passage. It gives us a framework to make our Bible study more meaningful. Within a short amount of time, we can look at word origins, historical context, definitions, and maps to find deeper meaning. Ultimately, it's a mini version of an in-depth Bible study techniques that we're gonna learn in the coming weeks. Now, personally, I love verse mapping because you can sit down for as little as 15 to 20 minutes, study a verse and apply it to your life. And if there is a verse that puzzles you or confuses you, you will have the tools that you need to study it on your own after this week. Also, you can use it as you read the scriptures during your quiet time or as a fun way to explain a verse to a friend. Now, the tools that you will need this week are a study Bible, an online concordance, I personally like the blueletterbible.com, a dictionary, pen, highlighter, and your workbook. As we mentioned last week, anytime we are studying the Bible, we should start our time with prayer, inviting the Holy Spirit to guide your study time. So if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to pause right now and take some time to pray as a group. And then when you are doing this on your own this week, make sure you begin your time with prayer. So let's get started. You'll first need to select a verse to map. When you are doing this on your own, you could choose your favorite verse or a verse that confuses you. You can also search for a topic you are interested in, like hope and strength, and select one of the verses you find. But today as a group, we are gonna map the verse found in John 16, 33. And we're gonna do this from the New International Version, or NIV. And this is what it says. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, we're going to pause for a minute here so that you can do two things as a group. First, everyone should use the chart in their workbook to write out the verse in the NIV translation and circle the keywords. Then I want you to look up John 16, 33 in the NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible, and the NLT, the New Living Translation. You can do this easily at Bible Gateway, Bible Hub, or in the Bible app. And then you're gonna have a different group member read those different versions out loud and discuss any differences you see among the three. Once you're done, come back and continue watching the video. All right, so what keywords did you circle? The keywords that I circled and that we'll be using as our study are peace, trouble, take heart, and overcome. Let's start by looking up the meanings in their original language which is Greek in this case, since we're in the New Testament. Now, if we were in the Old Testament and a passage in there, we would be looking up Hebrew words. So to look these words up, we're gonna use a tool called Strong's Concordance. As we mentioned in the first week, a concordance is like a word search for the Bible. It shows us all the areas a word appears in the Bible, and it will also give us a brief definition of the word. Now, Strong's Concordance works with the King James Version and the New American Standard Bible. We are gonna use the NASB version. Go to blueletterbible.org and pull up John 16, 33 in the NASB version. Then click the checkbox labeled Strong's. You'll notice that next to each word is a letter followed by a number. The letter is either G for Greek or H for Hebrew, and the number identifies a specific word in the Greek or Hebrew languages. If you click on the letter and the number code, you'll find a definition of the word and a list of other times the word is used in the Bible. Let's click on one of the keywords circled, peace. And it takes me to a new page where you see the Greek word, urene. I bet you didn't realize that we were gonna get a language lesson today and don't worry, in all honesty, it's all Greek to me too. Now, as we go, you are going to want to take some notes on the definition of the words in your handbook, and you'll see the definition for urene is one, peace, quietness, rest. It also says that the sense of the word is that a tranquil state of the soul assured of its salvation through Christ. Now, let's take a look at the next word, 
trouble or tribulation. You'll see a few definitions including pressing together or pressure, as well as oppression and affliction. Now how about take heart or take courage? The Greek here is tharseo, which translates to be of good courage and be of good cheer. You'll also see that tharseo is a verb that comes from the root word tharseos, a noun that means courage or confidence. So why is Jesus saying here in John 16, that we should take courage? Well, he is saying it's because he has overcome the world. And if we look at the other verses where the same word tharseo is used, we see Matthew 9, 2, that it can result from sins being forgiven. In Matthew 9, 22, from healing available when we have faith, and in Mark 6, 50, from the presence of Jesus. And finally, Acts 23, 11, it says when on a mission from God. In other words, it seems like we're going to take courage because God is present and at work. Now go ahead and pause the video now and take a few minutes to look up the last keyword, overcome. Write down the definition, read through a few of the other verses when it's used, and make note of anything else that strikes you. Now take a couple minutes to discuss what you learned and then come back to the video. Now, we want to look at the verse and research the following questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Now, the who here is Jesus, and he is talking to the 12 disciples, his 12 closest friends. And we actually know this because we read in John 13 that he was having a Passover meal with his disciples. But while John name drops only a couple of them, Matthew 26, where this same scene is also recorded, it specifically shares that Jesus sat down with the 12 and not a larger group of his followers. So now what is happening here in this scene? Well, we see that Jesus is reassuring the disciples that he's got them. And to find out the where, we can again reference Matthew 26, which tells us that Jesus ate the Passover meal upstairs in a house in Jerusalem. The when, as we've mentioned, is Passover, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. But this is also just after Jesus is betrayed by Judas and just before he heads to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he is arrested. So this is all taking place the night before Jesus is crucified. Getting to the why of this can sometimes be a little harder, right? It's more subject to interpretation, but in this case, the why is pretty clear. Jesus knew the disciples would face trials and he wanted them to know that he was in control and would not abandon them. Finally, the how. In this case, the how was a speech, a sermon of sorts. So now we have the definitions of the keywords and have answered the questions. It is time that we summarize what we have learned. First, Jesus was preparing the disciples for what would happen to them. We read later in the New Testament that the followers of Jesus faced persecution and even death for their beliefs after he was gone. At the same time, it would also foreshadow what would happen to Jesus. He would be arrested, beaten, and killed on the cross, yet he would be victorious and rise from the grave before ascending to heaven. In other words, he would overcome the world. Now, today, followers of Jesus in many parts of the world are still persecuted where being a follower of Jesus is a crime. And while we are not persecuted, there are times when following Jesus will require us to sacrifice friendships or family relationships, to sacrifice maybe money or time, or to risk embarrassment to share our faith. Remember, we are not promised a comfortable life. In fact, when you say yes to Jesus, he asks you immediately to do something very uncomfortable and declare your faith publicly by having someone else dunk you fully in the water. And for some of you, that might be very cold water, but just like we can have faith that we will rise out of the water and be made new, we can also take courage in the knowledge that God is in control and that through the risen Jesus, sin and death have been defeated. And whether we're dealing with relationship issues, financial challenges, or, or conflicts at work, God will give us the peace we need to rise up and face whatever life brings. So that's it. You've mapped your first verse. Your study of the Bible has officially begun. This week, each of you will select a verse and spend 10 to 15 minutes each day verse mapping. 
At your next meeting, each person will share what they learned about the verse they chose and how we can apply it to our lives. I cannot wait to see how God uses verse mapping to help you explore a deeper understanding of Scripture and God's heart. My favorite Bible verse is Romans 12, 2, and it says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is then you will test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, perfect will. And I think that means so much to me because... I grew up not a Christian, and the past three years I've been a Christian, and just reminding myself all the time not to conform to the patterns of this world that I once loved and strived for, with the, of that like performance mindset and success and all these things that you really think you desire. Um, once I have finally learned, like, do not conform to those patterns and like actually learn about God and His will for me. It's really changed everything and really just helped encourage me to keep going and to remember that His will is greater than anything that I could have ever asked for or imagined. I was baptized when I was in fifth grade. And what they did was give everybody at my church that was baptized their first Bible. And my Bible had my name on a sticker printed on it. And I thought that was the most incredible thing because my name was actually on the Bible. And I thought, okay, I'm going to start reading it. And I chose to start in the New Testament. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I realized that there's some similar material in, the, in there. So I kind of rushed through to get to Acts. Then I got to Romans. And I remember when I got to Romans 8, I thought, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And when I got to the last two verses of Romans 8, Romans 8, 38 and 39, that talks about the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And then it lists the things we think do but that don't. I remember in fifth grade, I said, this is my favorite verse ever. My favorite Bible verse, I believe my favorite, favorite Bible verse is Exodus 14, 14. And I know it's kind of a cliche one, but um, I grew up in a situation where I felt like I had to be a survivor and that I always had to fight everything. And God has been teaching me how to put my defenses down and how to be still and trust him to fight my battles. So um, Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you, you need only be still. And in moments where I feel like I need to put my dukes up or become defensive, he helps me to calm down and trust that he's got it and I don't need to do anything more than trust him. Yeah, so for me, once I got started into reading the Bible deeply, the season that I wasn't reading the Bible as much, I noticed that I was more anxious about things that were going on in my life. I wasn't as calm or didn't have as much, especially I didn't have as much clarity when it came to making the right decisions at that point in time. 